Oh, thank you so much for that, Trevor. Very much appreciated. Um, well, we've got lots to cover, as we mentioned earlier on. Uh, so we're going to be shifting our focus now to Professor William Gumede from um, the University of Vetvatersland, or VET, um, who is on the line for us. Uh, but before we go to Professor, just obviously you've just taken to the polls uh, a few days ago, and as you will know, that the 1st of November marked the sixth um, you know, municipal elections within a democratic rule. Um, some of the numbers that have turned out um, have been around voter participation, which have been disappointing. As the numbers started coming in, um, there were concerns that this is the lowest participation that we would have seen since 2006 at around 48%. So just to give you a sense, we had around 42 million people that were actually eligible to vote. 26 were actually um, registered and unfortunately or a very disappointing a 12 million people took to the polls on Monday. Uh, Professor Gumede, thank you so much for making the time to join us this morning. I've just uh, highlighted a couple of those, uh, you know, of those statistics with regards to voter participation, but of course you have seen these numbers coming through uh, in terms of the South African political landscape. Just to maybe, um, you know, high level, what are you making of the numbers that we We've seen uh, just your thoughts on what's currently going on. Um, thank you very much um, for inviting me, um, and I'm very happy to be here. I think the most important thing about the elections is the psychological barrier that uh, potentially the ANC will get under 50%. Um, if that is very, very important um, because the ANC has been a, a dominant party, and I think the energy that it will uh, release for the country. Um, for the ANC to go under 50 percent is very, very important. Um, so for me, that really is going to be, you know, the key, uh, one of the, our key things. Um, and the second thing is also, you know, some of the new generation parties, we can call them that, you know, X in South Africa um, and uh, uh, Masaba that really um, has done well. So, um, and then of course, thirdly is we are going into coalition politics. So this is sort of the beginning of coalition politics, which, which is more appropriate for our country. Our, our country's diversity um, needs um, coalitions rather than one dominant uh, party. There's been a lot of criticisms around coalitions. Um, one, can they actually work? And perhaps, perhaps maybe let me pop that second question, but you know, let's talk about coalitions because it has been said that you've got too many uh, cooks in the kitchen, so nothing ends up being done. Uh, is this what South Africa is going to be uh, faced with? You've mentioned the likes of Action um, SA, which now has been said to be you know, the king makership, for example, or has gotten mm -hmm. king makership status. Uh, just give us a sense of what the implications for South Africa? You know, I know there has been a lot of criticism about coalitions, but I mean, um, because the big coalitions that actually haven't, have, you know, that haven't worked have been in the news, um, we think, you know, all coalitions have failed. But actually, there's been smooth coalitions um, running in, in, in KwaZulu Natal, running in the Western Cape. Um, so, so, coalitions, I mean, in broad base, if we exclude those, you know, sort of spectacular failures um, in Zwane, um, in Johannesburg. Um, and um, down in Nelson Mandela Bay. Um, the rest of the coalitions have actually work. I mean, I also just extra, you, you know, just um, from, uh, for your viewers, um, that since the end of the Second World War in Africa, there's about between 50, 54 and 55 African countries. Um, so Africa, for four decades, the longest growth spurt and the most stable and, and, and the greatest anti-poverty uh, or poverty reduction has been in a coalition. Um, in Africa and it's Mauritius. So whereas almost every other liberation movement have failed in Africa, a coalition from the late 1970s to the late 1990s has produced a, you know, the most consistent growth rate in Africa. So from that point of view, you know, coalitions can work. So now why do coalitions fail? In the past, uh, it's sort of, you know, sort of the big failures. Um, you, you know, the first thing about them has been that they've often been put together, like in the Swanee case, the Joburg case um, in 2016, to oppose the ANC. Now that's uh, really, you can't have a coalition. Um, it has to be built on, uh, uh, on policies. Um, so, you know, parties have to put, uh, come together, put policies together that they agree on, and that's sort of a platform. The second thing is, what has always been missing in, in these coalitions is also a conflict mechanism. I mean, politics are very conflictual and the sort of partners are very conflictual. Um, so that is very important going forward, um, that that sort of thing is, uh, uh, um, will happen. Um, I'd like to get a little bit into 
voter behaviour or understanding the psyche of the voter. Now, um, driving here to the studio today, been listening to the radio, and there's a lot of um, discontent. People are so frustrated, and I think one of the things that certainly came out is why do voters keep making the same mistake if a particular party that they have voted for is not doing the things that it does? Now, I want to refer to a very brief ex um, extract that you had written and had, had to do with how communities who have suffered some sort of trauma um, end up sort of making particular types of mistakes. So if you look post-apartheid, one would say that maybe South Africa is a casualty of that trauma. Now we've got a new trauma in the way of um, you know, COVID-19. One could see it as a financial and economic as well as a health trauma. Maybe give us a sense of you know, a little bit of insights around um, voter psyche, voter mentality, and how this is likely to change given the fact that South Africa now finds itself uh, having to cope with another type of trauma. Uh, absolutely. I think, you know, um, because of our past, uh, countries like South Africa that has a past, uh, contest the past, uh, you know, between different groups. Um, so, uh, and then the political parties are often like the ANC liberation movements are based um, really on the past. And, and people's loyalty are really based on the role of the ANC. So that's very important. It's not only in our country, but also in other African countries, by many other countries, even in developing countries. And the problem is with people, um, when people vote um, on loyalty of the past, it could be race, it could be region, it could be religion, and so on. Um, that problem is there is um, a counterability problem immediately there because um, those who get elected on their basis know they will always get elected on their basis, and, and that is why they will never be held accountable. So although ANC, many ANC supporters desperately want service delivery, they've actually been voting against service delivery, so because they vote on loyalty. So the big thing for South Africa is going to be is, you know, the moment we move where a majority of the voters start begin to vote on the basis of competency, um, not on loyalty, not on color, um, you, you know, not on struggle credentials, that is really where we can to have a, a, a release of energy, growth spurts, um, uh, and so on. And then the second thing about ANC supporters in, 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 in this sort of context, you know, many ANC supporters come from a cult, a political culture where protesting in the street is more important. Although when you go for a street protest against your government, what happens is a short-term impact, whereas a voting um, protest in a ballot box, of course, is much more long-term. So, I, you know, so, we, so many ANC supporters haven't overcome this idea of they still um, perceive um, voting, oh, sorry, protesting in a street is more powerful than protesting um, in a ballot box. And then a third element of it is also that people don't see the, that one can vote against your party in order to make your party accountable because that's the magic of voting in fact that's most probably the most part more powerful element of, of voting not uh, just to vote for your party but to vote against your party even if you don't like the other party to hold your party accountable so but you know countries like our country with our your past polarization, that is a very difficult concept i mean you, you know the 2004 uh, world bank uh, global outlook sorry, World Development Report, actually discuss, not in the South African case, but in other cases, that sort of difficulty for society to overcome, how the voters need to make their jump from voting on loyalty or voting on color or ethnic base to competency in order to get at the service delivery. Um, speaking of service uh, delivery, I just want to shift gears a little bit and, and perhaps maybe moving on to some of the, you know, the pressing issues with regards to you know, South Africa's budget. Um, our fiscus has certainly been taking strain. Um, next week, we will have our new finance minister who will be tabling the budget. Now, um, the wage bill is certainly one of the big ones. And I know that you've also been very involved with uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa with his task team talking about economic policy talking about things that need to be done. Can you take us into you know, your confidence and just give us a sense of where we are with that and if this is definitely an area um, that we still do need to continue to be worried about? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you, you know, the most... So, uh, I mean, if it's not a local government, but our, our budget is going to be absolutely critical how we put it together. 
Um, I mean, we've got a new finance minister. And the finance minister, um, Enoch Gondawana, comes from the trade union background, is a very big supporter and ally uh, of President Sir Ramaphosa. So because he came from the trade union and more of the left part uh, of the ANC, I think he will be better able to push a pragmatic, a more market-friendly uh, and, and more business-friendly approach because that, you know, it's almost, uh, it almost gives him uh, almost a ring of, of, of legitimacy to do that. Tutumbe, when he really struggles to really stare down sort of the left and some of the populists in the ANC when it comes to the budget, uh, because his credentials, his political credentials was a little bit different. He sort of he came a bit more from a business, he was seen much more as a business. Um, but in Okondawana, I think he's much more, uh, although he comes from a trade union background, he understands um, the issues. He was colleague, a colleague of mine um, at the School of, of School of Governors. He had a good, good insight um, into, you know, the way his mind works. He does understand that we're really facing a fiscal crisis. We're really going to have to do a couple of things. And most probably it's the most important thing in terms of um, two things we have to do is the, you know, the public sector wage bill and the restructuring of the public service. It's going to be very, um, very important. And I think now that the ANC it, it has gotten, or it seems like, I mean, it's not yet confirmed, of course, under 50 percent, it really will put the pressure on the ANC, I think, to be much more pragmatic, much more practical, and less ideo uh, ideological. So that really is... I think even the outcome of this local government elections really is going to put the pressure on the ANC in a, you know, a good way, um, where the ANC really will become much more pragmatic and I think we'll see it in the budget also. Yeah. Um, Prof, you mentioned uh, something around um, having policies that are business friendly and I think one of the uh, ones that come to mind and certainly maybe when we speak to clients, uh, whether here or abroad, is around the expropriation bill. So maybe just give us a sense of what in its what about the bill uh, or this piece of legislation in its current format that still uh, presents um, an issue and i think for you know investors again whether it be here or overseas i mean what are the things that we need to be worried about yes for those who you know not aware so uh, currently there's a draft um, expropriation bill in parliament um, um, which will need to be voted on early next year um, and um, there are two views there. So the ANC caucus uh, currently um, is split almost 50-50%. One group who, who, who want to push for the expropriation without compensation. And another group is much more pragmatic where expropri expropriation of land were compensation. And then we have the EFF caucus in parliament, and of course, they want expropri expropriation without comp uh, compensation. So there's a, you know, for Ram uh, President Ramaphosa, there's a threat uh, that, you know, one part of his ANC caucus can vote for the EFF caucus and then, you, uh, you, you know, vote for a bill that will push for expropriation without compensation. Now, the problem with that bill is, and that is why ordinary citizens is really important for ordinary citizens because if one look, I did a piece of, um, a report for the ANC already in 2017, and you, you know, sort of re updated the report um, ahead um, of this debate in Parliament. And looking at four African countries um, since the end of the Second World War, they went for, uh, for land expropriation without compensation. And, normally, and that is Algeria, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. All four of those countries took between three and four decades for them to recover economically, to return back where they were because, you know, the economic impact of it is so devastating. Because expropriation of, of, of land is not just um, um, a land issue, it then becomes also property rights broadly because um, if, if one has a, a law that says expropriation without compensation, it could mean your, your next thing of your business, next thing of your mining right, it will be taken without um, a, a, a compensation uh, and so on. So that, and, and also, you know, the, the way the market economy works, a uh, property right is really at the heart of a market economy. So the moment one uh, um, threatens the property right aspect of a marketing economy that we see in Zimbabwe, for example, you know, the whole economy collapses. And, and, and I mean, the, the whole thing actually with expropriation 
uh, without the compensation. Normally, economically, the impact economically, you know, what happens is that there's immediately a food crisis, there's immediately inflation crisis, there's immediately a currency crisis. And then actually the poor people who voted for the party that implements the uh, expropriation without uh, compensation, normally those are the people who are struggling. And also, I must say to end of here, is that often actually the parties that introduce um, both expropriation without compensation, they are often voted out very soon thereafter because their own uh, voters actually suffer from it. Mm. Oh, that's certainly something to, uh, to be thinking about then. I'm sure um, we have a lot of, uh, I think, voters and South Africans that have sleepless nights thinking um, about some of these legislation. Oh, we can't talk about moving a country forward if we don't talk about you know, the, the current energy crisis, it seems that we are facing. So there were, you know, there were positives. Um, we did see that the country seemed to be moving in the right direction when it came to uh, being able to free up more energy in terms of the renewable energy space. Um, and then we also saw that the public um, enterprise minister was saying that going forward in terms of certain levels within ESCOM, um, their, you know, their salaries will now be linked to um, how well they perform. Uh, but ESCOM is still an issue. This ESCOM is still uh, a problem and we do know, that, you know all of these issues that have been very well documented. Now, I know that last week you were supposed to be meeting with ESCOM to talk about you know, the new supply chain um, and to talk about the way forward there, but that meeting did get um, cancelled or rescheduled. Just give us a sense, Prof, of you know, what this conversation or what this meeting will actually be about. What are you hoping to see and what does this actually mean? Okay, yeah, so our energy, energy crisis again is, a, you know, it's because of politics uh, um, and it's because of politics of state-owned state -owned entities. Um, at the moment, what is happening at the moment is that, um, you know, that um, part of our energy supply chain has been captured in the ANC politics. So, for, you know, like I'll just start off with, you know, coal, for example, there's a lot of um, ANC politicians who are really invested in coal. Um, so that be, it becomes very difficult for the ANC, you, you, you know, to move out of their space. That's the first thing. The second thing um, is that the, the trade union movement, the National Union of Mine Workers at ESCOM, ESCOM is their largest constituency. Now, the National Union of Mine Workers has been um, on, you know, its members have been declined because AMCO has uh, um, become more popular than them and uh, and the ANC because the ANC is in alliance with COSATU and the National Union of Mine Workers is COSATU's biggest trade union and and the National Union of Mine Workers also supported um, uh, Sir Ramaphosa for the presidency inside the ANC so there's a protection also of the trade union movement so for the new the new CEO has struggled to really right size ESCOM because ESCOM needs to be right sized because then there is the National Union of Mine Workers because if it does that, it means the National Union of Mine Workers will lose their members um, and they will become a, a weaker union um, and then they will object, uh, you know, in relation to the ANC. Then again, they, as I say, they, you know, um, the coal interest, um, which is really linked to the ANC, fund the ANC very heavily. They've been very much opposed to renewable energy. Then there's also a broad space. Um, a state-owned company is a very special, it's much more harder and difficult to reform a state-owned company once it captures. I mean, I was part of the, you, you know, I wrote part of the report of the 2009 Presidential Review uh, Committee on State-Owned Enterprise on that uh, reform program. And I try to explain how difficult it is to do a reform uh, um, because unless a CEO of a state-owned company gets all the political support um, and is allowed to right size, allowed to fire um, with staff and allowed to get a competent board, it becomes very difficult. So, you know, so far, I think um, the CEO of ESCOM has, has, has done a brilliant job under very difficult political circumstances um, because the board that he has, again, you know, or, you, it is, there's a whole lot of ANC interference of appointing a board, so you don't get the board with the expertise and the skills that you need to support you from CEO. You know, the management that he has, he has very difficult to, 
to, to, to fire people on the spot because a whole lot of that management on ESCOM is also linked to the ANC, very, very difficult to deal with. But even in that context, um, I think it's done a, a, a really, I think a really br brilliant job in, 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 in transforming it. I think as a society, we'll have to think at least of a three to five year uh, timeline before we can to get any turnaround in ESCOM, that is, so, you know, um, and also if he gets the political support. I think now, now that the ANC has gone down um, below 50%, he will get the support because there will be, I think, much uh, more energy in the ANC to do these reforms because they know if they don't do the reforms now, they will be out in the next, next national elections. Um, uh, Prof, thank you so much for that. Maybe just um, on a closing note, uh, on that, if there was one thing that you could give, you know, our president uh, ad advice on, on that one thing that they would need to implement uh, that would help us, that is a low-hanging fruit that South Africa needs to do, what would it be? I think the important thing is, is to bring the skills of the private sector um, to deliver. So we're in a financial crisis, we're in a power crisis, we're in a social crisis. Now, um, with liberation like the ANC, because they are uh, you know, instinctively uh, anti-business, so we don't, um, and, and South Africa's competitive advantage is our business, the ideas and the resources and the skill sets in business, which have been excluded from the ANC. So I think, you know, if there's a magic wand um, um, for the president to list all of the things that needs to be delivered, and then hand it over to business to deliver I think that will turn around the country, that will bring new ideas, new energy, and also new hope in the country. Oh, thank you so much for that, Professor William Gumete. Uh, thank you for joining us and sharing your very important insights. Of course, that was uh, Professor William Gumete from uh, Wits University sharing his insights there, following uh, us going to the polls on the 1st of November, which was just this Monday. Well, we're going to be...